This is Tyler Faulkner with Carlson Software, and in this video series, I'm going to be providing an overview of the Underground Mining Module. These videos will not cover every aspect of the module, but instead, I'm going to work through a simple example showing a lot of the commands that you might need when designing an underground mine. For this example, I'm going to be focusing on a room and pillar operation for coal. I'm not going to be diving into long wall applications but a lot of these commands will apply there as well. Now, this video is not an introduction to the basic use of AutoCAD or IntelliCAD. So a prerequisite will be knowing simple CAD drafting, layer management, changing entity properties, and things like that. Another important prerequisite is a solid understanding of Carlson grid files, which are discussed more in depth in the geology module overview videos. For these videos, I'll be working through this flowchart. The major topics are listed on the left, more detailed topics listed on the right. And on the right, anything that's written in black text is just simply a generic description of what you'll be doing, whereas anything written in blue is the name of a specific command inside of the program that I'll make sure I address. Now again, I'm not going to be talking about the geologic modeling portion. I'll briefly discuss some of the files that we need to get started but we to have another video series that dives into how to make those files. So my first main focus then will be on designing the mine panels. So I'll show how to create the line work, how to make edits to the panels, things like that. Next, I'll show how we can define the working parameters to define the equipment, mining rates, working calendars, and such. And finally, we're gonna calculate the timing of the mine. So we'll sequence out the panels, create a timing map, generate a report, and make some other edits. So let's get started and we'll take a look at some of the files we need and then we'll start drafting some panels. I'm gonna start off on my desktop here and I wanna show the files that I'm gonna be using for this project. So as you can see here, I have some of the basics. I have a drawing file already created and later on I'll talk about what's in that file. And I've got a backup initialization file, nothing special there. The other files that I have for this project are all grid files. So this is what I need coming out of the geology module. This is a coal project, so I've got a coal thickness grid. I've got a rock thickness grid, so basically some parting material within the coal. And then I've got standard quality grids, so ash, BTU, moisture, sulfur. So my prerequisites really for setting up the mine planning portion I need thickness and I need quality. You'll notice I do not have elevation grids here. The underground mining module really treats the mine planning as a two-dimensional problem. It will track how the thickness and the qualities vary across the area, but it's not going to track the elevation or the structures of the seams. So that's really the files that I need for setup. And let's go ahead and start up the program. I am going to be using Carlson Mining 2021 with AutoCAD Map 3D 2021. If you're using IntelliCAD as your base platform, all the Carlson functions will be exactly the same. There may be some differences as far as the way a dialog appears for basic CAD drafting, but the core functionality is going to be the same. So let's go ahead and start up the program. So I've got my drawing opened here, and I want to just take a quick tour through the layers and some of the line work that I've prepared. I'm going to take a look at my Layer Property Manager. And you can see the main thing that I'm looking at right now is my grid limit boundary. So this is just good to have for reference. This lets me know that anywhere outside of this boundary, I have not modeled thickness or quality. So I'm not going to be planning my mine outside of this boundary. In addition to that, I've got a few other boundary layers. One showing a mine hazard, uh, so a couple of them on there. So this is going to come into play when I'm doing the timing. So if I need to affect the mining rates in these areas, I'll just know that things may move a little bit slower in those areas. I've also got property lines, not required for every project. But if you do need to subdivide your reserve reporting by property, 
I'll be showing how to do some of that. The next few layers that I have are just contour layers. So I've got one here showing the heat content of the coal. So I've got my BTU values and those are color coded by value. So I can see how that varies across the property. I've also got a coal thickness contour map. So I can see where I've got thicker, thinner parts of the seam. A few other qualities as well, such as moisture, I've got some sulfur content, and I've got a rock thickness. So this will be just a uh, amount of parting that I have in the coal that has to be dealt with. The next few layers that I have are drawing events. These aren't required, but I'll be talking more about those once we get into timing aspect. Uh, but that's those can come in handy if you need to track certain events in the mining process. For example, when a new belt head comes into play, when you need to construct an overcast, things like that. The other layer that I have here, I've already determined a starting point for my mine, so I just put a symbol on the map there just to let me know where to start my first panel. A couple other layers in here, but I don't really need to dive into those right now. This just kind of gives an idea of some of the things I'm not really going to be diving into how to make these layers and just just want you to know that they are there for reference. So one of the first things that I want to do before I actually start laying out my mine is I need to know where is it actually going to be profitable for me to put in the mine. So there's a lot of different things that you can consider when you're trying to define those boundaries. For example, I might have a cutoff thickness. So if the coal got down to a very thin thickness, I uh, may not be able to economically mine that, so they may, that may be a no-go area. For my example here, uh, my coal thickness is ranging from about four and a half feet to uh, almost seven and a half feet in some areas. So as far as the thickness goes, I'm not gonna let that limit my mining. I'm just gonna say that everything's mineable. Now, another thing that might affect the mineability of the seam is the quality. So, for example, if I take a look at the BTU value, if I had some areas of the mine where it just had very poor BTU, um, very high ash content, something like that, that could also be a limiting factor. And as far as defining where you can economically mine, you can define those boundaries in whatever way makes sense to you, whatever type of restrictions you have for your operation. For my example, however, I'm going to make it very, very simplistic. I'm going to assume that the coal thickness and the coal quality is all favorable, but I'm going to limit myself based off of the property lines in my drawing. So for this next part of the video, um, I'm not going to go into all the details of just um, what I'm doing here, but all I'm going to do is I'm just going to mark out a part of this property where um, I don't want to mine into the Jones property. So I'm going to create a 200 foot offset from that property boundary and just hatch it in red just to give me something visual to look at to know that I don't want to place any of my panels in there. So now that I've got a very clear visual of where I cannot mine, uh, we're going to start drafting some of the panels. But before we do that, it's important to know kind of what our end goal is for drafting the panels. So these images here show two different options for how we can actually draw the panels in place. Um, it's very layer dependent. So certain parts of the panel need to be on certain layers. But I really want to stress that you can do all of this manually if you like. So Carlson does have a command that will draw generic panels for you. But if there's some type of edit that you want to make to the panels, so for example, if you want to use an array command to quickly copy these things, uh, you can absolutely do that. There's nothing special about them. And by that, I mean, this is all just standard CAD line work. So however you prepare these panels, uh, it's totally up to you. Regardless if you draw the panels with or without the pillars, being the main difference between the two options, the perimeter of the panel has to be on a layer named P-E-R-I-M, short for perimeter. And that polyline has to be a closed polyline. 
Next, the name of the panel is very important. Um, so every panel name needs to be unique. And for the panel tagging command I'm going to use, we have to put that label as a standard piece of text on the panel NM layer. So it's short for panel name. I do want to note the orientation of the text is important. So the text needs to be oriented down the length of the panel. So in these examples, you can see the text is readable from south to north. It's pointing to the end of the panel. If you're going to draw the panels with the pillars in place, the pillars have to be on the pillars layer, and each individual pillar needs to be a closed polyline. The pillars do not have to be square or rectangular. They can actually be any shape as long as it's a closed polyline. Another entity that you're seeing here, the cyan lines, are the projection lines. Now these are not required, these will not actually be used uh, for the calculation of the timing, but they're very, very handy whenever you need to branch one panel off of another. So I do recommend drawing those, and those go on the projections layer, but you can change that if you like. The next thing we need, if you're not drawing the pillars, you have to have some way to define the extraction ratio of the panel. And as you can see over on the right here, we have a blue piece of text on the extraction layer. And the value of that text is 0.6, meaning whenever we create this panel, the program will understand that the extraction ratio for that panel is 60% extraction. Now you can also specify an extraction ratio for the retreat of the panel by placing a second piece of text on a layer named RET underscore extract. So that can just be a totally different value to uh, extract a different amount of key material as you're pulling out of that panel. The last item I have on here is a difficulty factor. And although not required, this definitely does come in handy. So this is just another piece of text and the layer name is just difficulty. And that relates to how quickly is the equipment going to mine through that panel, where a value of 1.0 refers to normal mining rate. A higher value would actually be more difficult to mine. It would slow down the equipment. Um, but you can place those wherever you like. If you don't put a difficulty text, the default rate will be just 1.0, so just normal mining rate. So that just shows some of the line work that we're trying to create. So now we have an idea of what our end goal is. And again, you can use this with the available command, which I'll show in just a moment, or you can create this with standard AutoCAD drafting, whatever works best for you. So back in the drawing, I'd mentioned earlier that I had a predefined start point for the mine. I've just got a small symbol there showing where we want to start the mining. So the two commands, or uh, the uh, main command that I'm going to use for laying out the panels, it's found in the underground mining module on the works pull down. So there's two commands that can do this. There's basic projections and there's advanced projections. I pretty much always prefer to use the advanced projections command, uh, but the first command will do essentially the same thing. So I'm going to start the advanced projections command. And you can see I'm prompted here to pick a start point for the belt. So this will just be start point of one of the entries of the line that I'm going to create. And I'm going to snap it right on here. Keeping an eye on the command line, you can see I'm now being prompted for an end point for the belt. So basically the end of the panel. I can visually pick a point on the map or I can enter in an azimuth and a distance, and that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to press enter, and that's now going to prompt me for an azimuth. So I'm going to have this going in an azimuth of 315. And for the distance, um, the program is not going to draw a panel that has irregular geometry. By that I mean the program's not going to stop a panel in the middle of a crosscut. So if I don't know an exact distance, I can just screen pick a distance, 
or if I type something in, um, I just need to remember that that's going to be reevaluated based off the number of crosscuts that I define and the spacing of those crosscuts. So just for that example, I'm going to put in a very specific number of uh, 1381.2, but you'll see that panel is going to get um, resized based on the crosscuts. I'm prompted for how many entries I want on the left of the belt. I'll say four, and I'll do four on the right of the belt as well. And this dialog is going to determine my entry crosscut spacing, my entry crosscut width, and the sizes of my pillars. So up here at the top, I can define the center to center spacing of the, both the entries and the crosscuts. Uh, for my example, I'm going to stick with 60 foot for both entries and crosscuts. There's the option here to define some different layers. I almost never change these because these are going to use just the some of the standard layer names that we had referred to earlier. So I'm not going to change any of those. But two things that I do want to turn on, I want to draw the pillars for this first panel. For the majority of this video, I'm not going to be drawing pillars uh, just to make things a little bit quicker. But for now, I'll just throw those on there. Now when I'm drawing the pillars, I have to specify the width of the entries and of the cross cuts. And the center to center spacing minus the entry width will give us the size of the pillars. So for this example, 60 foot spacing, 20 foot entry, I'm going to have a 40 foot pillar. I'm not going to be talking anything about uh, trying to size up the pillars based off of uh, you know, the depth of mining or um, roof but I'm just going to stick with square 40 foot pillars and run with that. There's also another option I want to use here is I want to draw the outline of the panel. If I don't do that, it's just going to draw my projections and my pillars, but I need to have closed boundaries for the panel itself. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of other options on how this panel will be drawn. I'm not going to be diving into those. I'm just going to be showing very standard panels, but I will do a slight edit to show uh, it's just simple line work at the end of the day. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. It draws the belt line for the panel, and then I get this option to draw stopping and ventilation lines. Now these are totally optional. This is really just a practice of mapping out the mine but it really doesn't have an impact on the timing or the scheduling as far as the software is concerned. These would just end up being symbols on the map that we could use for reference. So with that in mind, I'm not going to draw the stoppings or the ventilation arrows now, but you could of course do that if you're trying to maintain the mind map. So I'm going to click OK, and there you can see it draws in the panel. So I've got my center line where my belt's going to go, that's uh, just a green line four entries on the left, four entries on the right. And you might remember I had put in a very, very strange, very specific distance. If I do a distance measurement from one corner of the panel to the next, you can see that it's cut that off at an exact 1380. It didn't use the distance of 1381.2. So it's lined it up so that we get uh, good spacing based on our crosscut dimensions. Okay, so that's got the first panel in there. I'm going to go ahead and draw another panel, still using that advanced projections command. I'm going to pick a start point for the belt, and for this point I'm going to snap onto the end of this belt line. Um, snaps are going to be very, very handy, specifically when you have these projection lines drawn. But this is just going to ensure that the centers of my panels are going to line up nicely. So I'm going to click right on the end of that belt. And this time I'm not going to enter an azimuth and a distance. I'm going to enter in some relative coordinates to make the panel a specific length um, without even having to think about azimuth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in the at symbol. And I'm going to make this panel 6,000 feet long going to the west. So when I do the at symbol, it means I'm typing in relative coordinates. So relative to that first mouse pick, I want to go west 
6,000 feet, so I'm doing a negative 6,000. And on the Y, I'm not changing at all. So this will just go 6,000 feet to the west. I'll press enter. For entries on the left of the belt, I'll do four, four on the right. I get the same dialog again, but this time I'm not gonna draw the pillars. You'll see why here in a second. I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. Again, I'm not gonna mess with the stoppings and the ventilation. Click OK. And when I zoom out here, you can see that my panel has been drawn, but it's not really matching up very nicely with my other panel. So this is where I do have to do some manual edits on the perimeter, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time trying to draw the actual panel or the actual pillar cuts here. For that, I'm just gonna defer back to a standard extraction ratio of about 60%. So the only thing I really need to do here is I can actually ignore these overlapping projection lines. Uh, that's not gonna be a problem but I need to move the panel perimeter. So what I'm gonna do for this step is I'm just gonna take this panel corner and I'm gonna move it until it runs into that intersection. For the first panel that I drew, I'm gonna do the same thing, just grab the corner, bring it back to that intersection line. And now they're not overlapping there, but I do have this triangular wedge uh, that's I need to get filled in. So for this step, I've got my extension snap turned on in CAD. And I'm going to grab this corner of the pillar. I'm going to push it outwards, letting my extension snap carry me forward. I'm going to go farther than what I need to do. Do the same thing with this panel, using that extension snap just to get to the point where these two lines cross. And now I can see exactly where they need to come back together. So I'm going to grab this corner, put it right on the intersection there. Grab this corner, put it right on the intersection there. And I've got some midpoints for these poly lines that I actually don't need to have. So I'm just going to remove those vertices. And if I'm just looking at the perimeters, you can see that that really didn't take too much editing to get those lined up. Again, I'm not going to worry about drawing the rest of the pillars. If I did want to, uh, that would require some manual edits to uh, define the new shapes of the pillars. So for simplicity and speed, I'm just going to be weaving the pillars turned completely off. Um, I don't have to mess with cleaning up these projections because they're not going to get used for the sequencing. But again, if I'm mapping things out, I could take some time to do that. So those are my first two panels in place. And I'm just going to keep on doing that. And I'm going to repeat that process, adding in some more panels. Let me get one more coming off here. And for this one, I'm going to make it go directly to the south. So here, I'm going to just pick a cross cut to place this first one. Let's see, for the length of this panel, I want it to go straight to the south. So I'm going to use my relative coordinates again. I'm going to say at zero, so it's not going to go west or east, comma. I'm going to make it go a negative 1860. For this one, still four entries on the left, four entries on the right. I'm keeping this dialog exactly the same. Click OK. OK. And there I've got that panel in place. Now, if I wanted to have a whole series of panels uh, branching off from this main one running to the south, I do not have to run that advanced projections command over and over and over again. All this is just simple CAD line work. So I'm going to take advantage of some drafting commands to speed this up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my array command. You can either type it in or you can use it from the pull down menus. So type it. And I'm going to select everything in this panel. Ask for the type of array. I'm going to say it's going to be rectangular. And I can see it immediately draws an example when in there. I'm just going to go ahead and end the command. I'm going to click on that array and I'm going to edit the properties of it. So for example, I don't need more than one row. So I'm going to change that down to one row. 
Okay. And for the columns, I'm going to make, let's do 10 columns. Okay. And controlling the spacing on this. So the array command does have a couple of grips here where I can kind of manually space things out, move them closer together. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a quick measurement using my distance command. And I want to measure what's the distance between this intersection of the projections over to here. And I can see that's about 600. So with that, I'm going to pick my array, properties, and I'm going to change the column spacing to negative 600 so that it offsets to the west. And I can see what it's doing there. So it's offset my 10 panels for me. And I can see I've got one spilling over here. So I could either make this perimeter go out further, but just for sake of moving quick here, I'm just going to get rid of one of those panels and we'll have nine of them set up there. So that's good to go. So my next step, I'm going to have a couple of kind of sub mains coming off of this running to the north. And for that, I'm just going to do the same as before. Advanced projections, pick a start point for the belt. I'll go about here. And this is where my red boundary is going to come in. So I don't know just by looking at it what this distance is up to this red line, but I'm going to visually pick a point and just go as far as I possibly can. Uh, so here, if I actually hold down my shift key, it'll walk me into ortho mode and I can see I can get to about 2700 or so. Uh, let's just click it right about in there. For this one, I'm going to do just say two entries on the left, two entries on the right. And I'm going to keep all my other settings the same here. Click OK. OK. And there's a submain coming off. I'm going to do one more, kind of running to the north here. So let me press Enter to repeat that command. And for this one, I'm, I don't know exactly how far it needs to be from this submain to fit in. Uh, equal sized production panels, but I want to show how we can edit that later on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a this submain kind of close to it and show how we can move it later on. So pick that point there. I'm going to make it run to the north, out to here. I'm going to say two on the left, two on the right, same settings, and we're good to go. All right, so. Now let's suppose I want to do the same sized panels that I have here running up both sides of this submain, both sides of this submain. So for that, um, rather than drawing a new panel, creating an array, I'm just going to pick this array. I'm going to copy it, drop it about there. I'm going to rotate it. And now I can move it appropriately to make it match the submain. And so for that step, I'm just going to use my move command on that panel there. Click here, snap it right where I want it to go. And there we go. So now again, I can just resize that array, get it sized back out, and we're in good shape. Now to get it copied over here, um, you notice I can't just copy it because of the way that my um, line work is set up. I would have some things kind of pointing in the wrong direction. So what I'm going to do is use my mirror command. Pick on that array and the first point of the mirror line will be down the center of the submain here. Pick another point further down on the center. I'm asked if I want to erase my source objects. I'll say no. And there we go. So now that panel is in place and I've got an array again. I can just edit as much as I need to. So at this point, if I wanted to do the exact same couple of arrays tied onto this panel, I can see that if I take this, copy it over to here, it's going to run into each other. So what I'm going to do, move command. Let's pick all of these entities here. And let's move them over a bit. 
So for this, I'm just going to snap on to here. Let's move it to about there. And I want you to go a bit further, so I'm going to repeat that command. Select the previous entities, move it a bit further. And let's go about here. Get there. Okay. So now um, I want to take these arrays, copy them onto this submain. So I'm going to do a copy there and there. And if I'm just smart about the copy points, see this is a pretty easy thing to do. And okay, looks like I've still got some of the some overlap on these panels here. So let's do some movements. Let's do it on actually these panels. Let's bring those over a bit. Okay, so now I can see I've got some good spacing there. And if I want to resize these arrays, let's do maybe just something like that. Not getting as detailed with this as I potentially could. Just want to show some of the different editing options that we have available to us. Okay, so we're good to go there. Um, and those panels are in place. And with those panels in place, let's take just a quick second to realize where we're at in preparing these. So I now have perimeters on the prim layer, but I still need to have labels for each of the panels. And for the way I'm preparing these panels, I also need to specify an extraction ratio on the extraction layer. So I'm going to assume that my panels are good to go for now. But since I have some of these array entities, I actually need to explode those arrays to get them back down into their base parts. So now we can see I can pick on those individual lines. And as I mentioned earlier, I really don't need to have these projection lines on when it comes to preparing the panels. So I'm just going to freeze that layer. And now we've just got boundaries for the panels. Good to go. Next thing I'm going to do is put some labels on each of these panels so we can just give them a unique name. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to make sure I have the correct layer, which I don't have in here just yet. I'm going to create a new layer name, and the layer will be panel NM, so short for panel name. Uh, the color is not really important, but I'm going to make it red so it stands out. Make that my current layer. And now to put the labels on these panels, it's just a standard piece of text oriented in the right direction. But rather than place a piece of text, type in the name, place a piece of text, type the name for all of these panels, I'm going to use a command that will draw those a little bit quicker for me. I'm going to go to the Draw pull down menu, and I'm going to go to Sequential Numbers. Very handy command for adding labels. So what this command does is I can specify a starting number, I can specify a prefix, size of the text, and I can tell it to increment that number with every single click that I do. So for this first one, um, I'm just going to label this as main 1, this as main 2. So for this example, I'll start on number 1. The prefix will be main followed by a space. Text size will be 50, that's fine. Justification really isn't important. Uh, I don't need a symbol. I'm gonna automatically increment the labels. And for this first time, I'm gonna align the first piece of text down basically with a northwest direction, this one with a west direction. So I am gonna ask it to prompt me for the alignment every time. I'll click OK. Pick the point for the label position. Now you'll notice as I move my cursor over each of these perimeters, I get this little star in the geometric center of the panel. That is the geometric center snap. Really comes in handy for things like this. So I'm going to pick right on the center there, and then I'm going to snap to the midpoint of the end of the panel, and I can see it just types in main one for me. I'll do the next one, snap to the center, align to the midpoint of the end of the panel, and I've got main two. Good to go. Let's press enter to end the command. And let's do the same thing for these two sub mains here. I'm just going to press enter to restart the command. If 
for this one, I'm going to, um, for the text on this, let's just call this starting back on one. And for the prefix, I'll call this submain. Make sure followed by a space. This time, I don't need to align the text differently every time because these are both going to be aligned to the north. So I'm going to turn that off. Click OK. Put the first one right here. Snap to the center. I'll only have to align the first piece of text. Drops it in, and now when I click for the second one, it just drops it in immediately. So that's good to go. Now I'm going to do the same thing on these south panels. Repeat the command. Start off text number one. Prefix for these will just be south followed by a space. Pick the first one, align it to the south. And then I can just kind of go right down through here and now I'm going to do the same thing for the rest of these panels and I'm just going to speed the video up here but it's the exact same process. Uh, note that I do not have to use this sequential numbers command. I could also just copy text, use arrays of text if I wanted to make edits. Uh, it's very very open as long as you end up with a piece of text on the panel in M layer that is oriented in the right direction. That's all you need. I'll just also mention that this text doesn't have to be placed in the exact center of the panel. So you can move it closer to the start of the panel, closer to the end. The only thing that really matters is the orientation of the text. And now that I have all of those labels placed, there's just another thing that I need before I can actually tag these as panels. And that's going to be the extraction ratio. Now every single one of these panels needs to have an extraction ratio defined and that's done by having a piece of text on the extraction layer. Now rather than going through the exact same exercise where I draw a piece of text on the right layer and um, you know click every spot in the panel where I want to do it, I'm going to take the labels that I currently have and make a copy of them and convert them into something else. So I'm going to isolate to just show these pieces of text and I'm going to use the command called copy to layer. I'm going to select all of these pieces of text and the layer name that I'm going to create is extraction. Say OK. That's now made a copy of all those pieces of text. We can see the new layer has been made. I'm going to make that a blue and we've actually got some labels overlapping there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that my current layer, turn off the panel names, and now we can see all this blue text on the extraction ratio, or on the extraction layer, excuse me. So now what I need to do is convert those into actual numbers. And I'm just going to do that with a find and replace on the text. So I'm basically going to use a wildcard to replace all that text with a specific value. So let's expand this out. Notice I am going to turn on the option here to use wildcards and that's a asterisk in the find what. And for the replace with, I mentioned earlier I was going to use about 60 percent for the extraction ratio. For the panel geometry it's not exactly 60 percent. Um, the exact extraction ratio for my main panels is about 57.33%, which I'm, extract, or I'm expressing as a decimal value, so 0.5733. And I'm going to select the objects I want to replace there, highlight those, and we'll hit replace all. So that's modified 37 pieces of text. And if I zoom in here, I can see everything is set to a 0.5. 733. Now for my two submains, those are the only ones here that had a different panel geometry. So recall the mains in the production panels had four entries on the left, four entries on the right. The submains only had two on the left, two on the right. So those do have a slightly different extraction ratio, which is 0.5897. Again, if we had drawn the pillars in the panels, these values would be calculated for us automatically. 
but for longer range planning, uh, this is just a lot quicker to just punch in, just use similar numbers for similar panels. Okay, so now I have both the panel names and I've got the extraction specified. So I've got all the text I need. It's perfectly okay to have that text overlapping. It's not going to create a problem. And I'm good to go as far as my line work setup. So just turning back to our flow chart, in this video we just covered how to create the line work for the mine panels. In the next video I'm going to talk about how to actually convert that line work into a Carlson panel. So we'll actually tag it and then I'll go through some of the steps to editing the panels.